It's time to eat. What are you hungry for? Sit down and get ready to consume an abundance of fantasy football knowledge from Ross Tucker and Joe Dolan. Feed me now! I'm starving! On the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. Yeah, let's eat, baby! It is the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast presented by DraftKings. By the way, their best ball is out. It's amazing. Joe and I talked about best ball last week, gave you some heads up on some quarterback situations. Absolutely check that out. Here's what we do. 30 minutes of on-demand audio and video, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL, if you prefer, of content talking fantasy football. I'm the former NFL offensive lineman that likes fantasy. It makes the games more interesting more entertaining. It's like combining the stock market and football. It's awesome. You can check me out on social at Ross Tucker NFL. Really check out all of our shows at Ross Tucker Pod. He is Joe Dolan at FG underscore Dolan, the fantasy gangsta from fantasypoints.com. Use the code 21 feast. If you go over there to sign up for another year, which you should. The amount of content they're churning out is ridiculous, especially for how much they charge. They put out more and they charge less. Seems like a pretty good business model for those of you that like to get that extra insight, the extra edge for fantasy. Check him out at FG underscore Dolan. He is the number one ranked fantasy analyst in the world over the last five years. And he is rocking the exact right hat on today's show, Joe. Go Sixers. I'm ready, Ross. Um, you know, like it, it was I was actually listening. Um, I was driving back from Atlanta this past weekend, listening to basketball on the radio. And McGinnis, who do, is who's the Sixers radio, he's both the play-by-play guy and the analyst. He does it all himself. Just I, I don't know, you know, you and I talk for a living. The guys who can call basketball and hockey on the radio and like paint a picture of what's going on and your list. These are chaotic sports on the radio and they can paint a picture of what's going on. Just utmost respect um, for those guys. So I actually listened to the last Sixers game against Washington on the radio. Um, I mean, I'm looking forward to tonight. Um, Just like, I, I, I just feel something about the team. They just like, when, when a guy is down, the next guy, picks him up. Obviously, Tobias Harris was ridiculous in game one, and Embiid's always ridiculous, and Ben Simmons is insane defensively, and they've got they've got uh, the only Curry still alive in the NBA playoffs. <laughs> um, George Hill has been a great addition to the team. I, I, I'm just, I'm, I love rooting for him. I can't wait for tonight. I'm go- Ross, I'm going to be grilling out some barbecue chicken with the best barbecue sauce in the world, which is mustard-based barbecue sauce. Um, that is a controversial take, but I do live in South Carolina. Um, so you have to, you, you, I, I love my Carolina barbecue sauces. Going to be making some barbecue chicken, going to be grilling out, going to be watching the Sixers tonight. It's going to be fun, you know, and hopefully if you guys like watching the NBA basketball, you know, maybe put a couple wagers on the DraftKings Sportsbook, of course. I mean, maybe we can talk some fantasy football, get you in a best ball draft. Ross, I'm in my first DraftKings best ball draft right now. Um, it's a slow draft, but I opened, you know, it, it, it's interesting. And I, I'm sure as, as we go through um, in the next coming months, we're going to be talking about like the DraftKings ADP and some of the strategies uh, on on DraftKings uh, uh, fantasy football. But some of the ADPs are really interesting. And I managed to open my team from the 10 spot with Tyree Kill. Uh, I opened with Tyree Kill at 10, Nick Chubb at 15, and Miles Sanders at 34. And I, I think like some of the ADPs on DraftKings are a little bit different than what you're used to because of some of the scoring, and we'll talk about all that. But when I finish this team, hopefully by next week, it's a slow draft. Um, we'll be able to talk about it and pick up some of the things I've noticed. But I hope everybody, you know, you're on DraftKings Sportsbook, Best Ball. You're doing all that while you're watching basketball tonight. It's that it's a wonderful time of year. I am working, by the way, on getting it set up so that you and I can do best ball drafts against our listeners Love it. or viewers and absolutely dominate them. I can't wait. Yes, I'll be watching the Sixers. Joe and I both grew up 
different areas outside of Philadelphia, but still as fans of the Philadelphia sports teams. I will just say this before we dive into the wide receiver rankings. This is going to be a very valuable episode talking about rookie wide receiver mm -hmm. rankings. We've already done over the last few weeks the tight ends, the quarterbacks, the running backs. So you can hear where Joe has these guys ranked, not only amongst each other, but where he has them ranked among all the veterans at the position. I'll just say one last thing about the NBA. And yes, DraftKings has a good promotion. Use the code Ross. But I really dislike the Nets. Like <laughs> I really, first of all, Joe, you grew up in eastern pennsylvania like right on the border right right right, right with right uh, literally uh right across uh, I, I grew up in easton pennsylvania which is in the lehigh valley um which is about an hour outside of philly um and literally the rivalry i didn't go to easton high school i went to i was a prim and proper catholic school boy i went to uh, i went to notre dame high school in easton pennsylvania but uh the, the big football rivalry there is East in Phillipsburg, Phillipsburg's in New Jersey, and their name is literally the State Liners. So, like, literally, I grew up on the State Line of, of, of Pennsylvania that, and Jersey. Joe, is that Notre Dame of Green Pond? I went to Notre Dame of Green Pond, yes. Oh, that's in Easton. I didn't know yes. that. Yes, that's in Easton. Um, I, uh, the, uh, I am the second most famous alum of Notre Dame of Green Pond after Marco Andretti. Yeah, that's the that's my oh. claim. To and I'm also the second most famous person from Easton, Pennsylvania, on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio because Lisa Ann, the lovely Lisa Ann, is also from Easton, Pennsylvania. Lisa so, Ann is <laughs> yes. from Easton. That is interesting. I didn't know that. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I just – I never met a Nets fan. I met one Nets fan my entire life. There aren't really Nets fans, and now they're coming out of the woodwork when I watch these games. Anyway, oh. that's not why people are here. Oh, yeah, people I, I are just, here. Kevin Durant, Ross, uh, he, he doesn't do it for me. Let's just The whole that team annoys the yeah. crap out of me, which is why I hope the Sixers smash them. I'm nervous about it, but yeah. I hope they play them. I hope they smash them. Maybe the Bucks can wear them out. I don't know. Uh, let's get to these – Rookie wide receiver fantasy rankings. You know what's interesting, Joe? To throw these guys at you, I go to NFL.com and I look at the draft tracker, right? Because it shows you where these guys were drafted. I didn't realize this. They actually gave Devontae Smith a better grade than Jamar Chase. Wow. Who has a significantly better grade than Jalen Waddle. Like Devontae Smith, 7.13. Jamar Chase, 7.12. Very close. And then a little drop off to Waddle, 6.86. Then you get a big drop off to Elijah Moore, Kadarius Toney, et cetera. So at any rate, we'll go in the order they were drafted. So let's go Jamar Chase. Right. Joe, they've got T. Higgins. They've got Tyler Boyd. What does that mean for where you're stacking up Chase to start? Yeah, so Ross, this is uh, – I would let, let's just put it this way. I obviously respect the work uh, Lance and, and the team do at NFL Network, and 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 I love or NFL.com, and I love um, his work for sure. I would not have given Devontae Smith a better grade than Jamar Chase, and very clearly the Cincinnati Bengals did not either. They took Jamar Chase fifth overall, and Ross, you can make the argument they took Jamar Chase fifth overall at a position that was not a need for them. I know A.J. Green is gone, but that is a position that was not a need. You know, you can make the prudent pick. You're a lineman, Ross. You can make the argument that the prudent pick was to sit, sit there and take Penny Sewell. So they didn't do that. They do, they viewed uh, Jamar Chase as an elite player, and they took him uh, ostensibly to replace A.J. Green in that offense. Now, Jamar Chase is my highest-ranked rookie wide receiver on my board in my best ball rankings, I have him at wide receiver 24. That makes him a number two uh, wide receiver uh, by strictly by the numbers, but could be a really good number three wide receiver. So let's look though at the at, at the fact that all right, there are targets that T. Higgins and and Tyler Boyd need to get here in this offense. That is a fact. Those two guys are going to eat up a lot of targets. But AJ Green had a hundred and four targets last year 104 now he didn't produce anywhere near that level he but he had a 104 targets last year he caught just 47 passes he had just 523 yards last year and he had just two touchdowns on those 104 targets 
if you just give those 104 targets to Jamar Chase Ross, I'm predicting 20 more catches. I'm predicting close to 500 more receiving yards. I'm predicting three to five more touchdowns. I think Jamar Chase can put up those kind of numbers in this offense. I have him ranked at wide receiver 24. I think you can make the argument that's a little light, but the problem here is you still have the questions with Joe Burrow. It was wonderful to see him out there this week at OTAs as he's recovering from that devastating knee injury. And you do still have two really good targets. T. Higgins is coming off a great rookie season where uh, he he moved all around, play, can play some X, can play some Z. Tyler Boyd's one of the premier slot receivers in the NFL. This is obviously going to be a base 11 personnel team. We know that. It's going to be mixing out of the backfield, and those three receivers are going to play an overwhelming majority of the snaps. I actually have Jamar Chase ranked the highest of my Cincinnati Bengal wide receivers. Um, they're close. And the, again, the reason I don't have Jamar Chase higher than this is because I respect uh, what, what they have at the wide receiver position. I have Chase t- wide receiver 24. I have Tyler Boyd, wide receiver 28, and I have T. Higgins, wide receiver 32. That is a really tight bunch of wide receivers here. Um, It's hard to differentiate them right now, but I think Jamar Chase fits the profile of a dominant X receiver. He's nasty. He's physical. He's athletic. Um, There is so much to like about this guy. The fact that, that Joe Burrow threw him the ball in a national championship season, there's a lot to like about him there as well. I love the fit. Um, I, the only reason he's not a top 20 receiver for me and not to say he can't finish top 20 is because of that competition for targets. They're going to be able to spread that ball around. So a couple of thoughts here. First of all, did AJ green just have the worst season in wide receiver history? Uh, I mean, the way you just described that, Joe, I can't imagine a guy doing less with that many targets. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot, Ross. And if you want me to get into some numbers as I go through and I and I bring up our, our database here at FantasyPoints.com, it was, I don't want to call it the worst wide receiver season in history, but for a guy who has the pedigree, Ross, of an A.J. Green I mean, it was pretty much up there. So let, let's take a look at let's take a look at AJ Green's target share vis-a-vis where he produced. And my, my database is loading here because, like you said, I mean, I'm trying to compare and contrast him to like uh his peers at the position. But this is a guy who had 104 targets. Okay. That is a sizable portion of the target share that AJ Green had. So you you take a look at 104 targets and and what that means. Okay. So I'm looking at Adam Thielen. Adam Thielen had 108 targets, and you know how he produced. So let's let's take a look. 104 targets for A.J. Green. He averaged seven, seven fantasy points per game. To go down to somebody else who averaged less than seven fantasy points per game, you're going all the way down to Anthony Miller, who had 76 targets and averaged 6.9 fantasy points per game. A.J. Green's catch rate was 37.7. That is abominable. I mean, it was just horrific at that um, at that at, at that number. So you're looking at just uh, just uh, horrific production. So 104 targets, seven fantasy points per game in PPR. You're going all the way down to Anthony Miller. Remember, that's down all the way at 76 targets. But let, if you want to contextualize this even further, Ross, and I, I don't want to do this. This is a rookie wide receiver podcast. I don't want to just crap on AJ Green, but at a <laughs> At 104 targets, he had 111.3 total fantasy points in PPR. That's behind Demir Bird. That's behind Travis Fulgham, who had 67 targets. That's behind Antonio Brown, who had 61 targets. That's behind David Moore, who had 47 targets. So, like, he he had a horrible season. And even if you just give Jamar Chase those targets, Jamar Chase is going to produce, and he's going to produce at a high level. I'm pretty confident in that. All right, what about – let's move on. Let's get to Jalen Waddell in Miami. Mm -hmm. This one's one's a much tougher ranking for me. Again, one one thing you're going to see with, like, a lot of these first-round wide receivers is I wasn't, like, terribly fond of a lot of the landing spots, and this is kind of one of them. I have Jalen Waddell at wide receiver 48. And I anticipate that Jalen Waddle, although I thought I thought he was actually a better prospect than Henry Ruggs, 
I wonder if he's going to frustrate in much the same way as Ruggs did as a rookie. Just those pop-off games where he's going to catch three passes for 110 yards and a touchdown, uh, five passes for 130 yards and two touchdowns, and then he's also going to have weeks where he has one catch for nine yards. And and the reason I look at it like that is number one, the depth here. You know, it's not it's not like an elite receiving core, but you do have guys who are going to command the football in in ways. You're gonna, you're going to get the Devonte Parker's going to get the football. Will Fuller's going to get the football. He has a one game suspension to start the year, but he's going to get the football when he's out there. Mike Kosicki is going to get the football. They drafted another tight end, um, so there is a there is competition for targets here. Tua didn't have a great rookie season, um, so they the, there's there's some questions there though too of course has a rapport with Jalen Waddle which is a recurring theme here from these first round wide receivers from their time together uh, at Alabama so from from this pr- perspective I have Jalen Waddle as an upside pick in best ball wide receiver 48 if I'm doing redraft I'm probably going to be overall um, I, I, I would I would tend to think Jalen Waddle is going to be pretty annoying in that format as opposed to best ball when you can use those pop off weeks and uh, and and not worry about the the low end weeks. That was exactly what I was going to say. It sounds like he's better off for best ball. What about his Alabama teammate Devonte Smith, who went number ten overall? To the Eagles, in terms of landing spot and in terms of of where uh, somebody like Devonte Smith of his caliber can get targets, uh, Philadelphia is a really good spot. The question just is, how much are they going to throw the ball with Jalen Hurts at quarterback? It can Jalen Hurts take a step up from contri- from completing twenty fifty two percent of his passes as a rookie, um, or are they just going to be more of a run based team? But Ross, uh, the every anticipation from me and, and in our staff at fantasypoints.com is Devonte Smith's going to come in here in Philadelphia and lead this team in targets. That's my anticipation. It's just a matter of how many targets is that going to be? I have him at wide receiver 33 overall, um, drafting him pretty aggressively as a number three wide receiver for fantasy. Um, and, and I think, I mean, I guess you can make the argument that 33 is actually kind of conservative for me, um, but I anticipate he's going to come in. He's going to start right away. Jalen Rager, their first round rookie from last year, didn't have a great rookie season, but he said he's going to be playing the slot this year. That's what he said at OTAs. He's going to move around, but they're going to put him in the slot. Um, I anticipate they're going to put Devonte Smith at X and Z. Um, I think he's probably a little bit of a better fit as a Z as as you know from talking to Greg Cosell on your podcast, he can get out physical over there. Nothing against his toughness. It's just the fact that he weighs 166 pounds. Um, but I, I think you want to get Devontae Smith on the move. Ross, I think I think he's going to leave Philadelphia in receiving as a rookie. I really do. I thought the um, Jalen Rager playing a lot in the slot was interesting. I wasn't expecting that. Well, yeah, it's also... I mean, Eagle fans are flipping the F out because apparently that's the reason they didn't draft Jalen J- Justin Jefferson last year is because they viewed him as a slot receiver. Uh, now Jalen Rager is going to be playing the slot. Now, you also have to keep in mind, this is a new scheme. Nick Sirianni um, is, is coming in. And I, I'm, you know what I'm willing to do, Ross? Uh, and again, rookie wide receiver podcast here, but. I don't think anybody should be writing off Jalen. I'm not telling you to draft him in the sixth round, but I don't think anybody should be writing off Jalen Rager after last year. Look, the entire offense in Philly was broken. Wentz was broken. Peterson was broken. They had so many injuries. Rager got hurt and tra- uh, at the beginning of the season. Um, it had no off season. It, you know, if there's a situation where you're going to give a guy a clean slate, that's probably it. Uh, but uh, that being said, Devontae Smith has has the mindset that I didn't see from Jalen Reger. He obviously has the pedigree uh, at Alabama. He won the Heisman Trophy. Devontae Smith's going to lead this team in receiving. All right, let's get to Kadarius Toney. He went 20th overall to the New York Giants. Oh. I have no freaking clue where to rank this guy. Uh, you're gonna say like you're gonna see like with Waddle and Tony and like it's a really tough uh, a, a, a tough scene here for ranking these guys. Current in my best ball, I have Kadarius Tony at wide receiver 75. And if and if you want me to be honest, I'm I'm looking at that right now and I'm like, man, that's low. 
but it's just an, just an expectation of where I'll probably be drafting the guy. It's going to be as a wide receiver five or a wide receiver six in best ball. There's a ton of competition for targets with New York. They just brought in Kenny Galladay. You obviously have Pro Bowl tight end Evan Ingram, who's going to get 100 targets and drop half of them, but there, he's going to get those targets. Sterling Shepard is still there. Darius Slayton is still there. Uh, they brought in Kyle Rudolph, who's mostly going to block, but I'm sure he's going to command some red zone targets. Saquon Bar- Barkley out of the backfield. So my question is, when it comes to these giant receivers, do I want any of them? And I'm not really sure I do. I think maybe the play here is to invest in Daniel Jones. I think Daniel Jones might be one of those fantasy quarterbacks who everybody thinks stinks, so nobody wants them, but he can do a little bit with his legs, and you've got a roster here that's kind of loaded up at, at wide receiver and tight end and running back where you can foresee Daniel Jones putting up some numbers in this offense. But Kadarius Tony is a very raw receiver, just learning the position. At Florida, he was almost exclusively out of the slot, and he's running one, two kinds of routes. You have to think he's going to come in and play the slot. Maybe he'll come out of the backfield now and again. Um, but that also raises the question, what do they do with Sterling Shepard, who clearly in his NFL career has been better when he's played out of the slot? So are they going to play him out of position? Do they think, oh, Tony, I would guess, if you draft Tony in the first round, you eventually think he can be more than just a slot receiver. But are they going to let him – Or is he going to be learning on the fly? Is that going to affect his production? It's not really the kind of profile I see that 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 allows for a fantasy explosion as a rookie here. Yeah, I mean, I feel like they want to try to get the ball in his hands and sure. be creative, whether it's wide receiver screens or jet sweeps, I guess – I don't know. We'll have to see whether or not Jason Garrett has it in him to be that creative, to get him the ball that much. You know, when you think Jason Garrett, I don't think you think like a whole lot of uh, outside the box stuff. And that's the other question here. You know, Jason Garrett's always been a running kind of uh, of offensive coordinator and play caller. He likes the run game. Saquon Barkley is going to be back, and we'll see how his recovery progresses throughout the summer. But it's just one of those weird fits. That I'm not sure how everything's going to go going to go together. You know, they have Kenny Galladay. Galladay's going to be the X here. We know that. You know, so quite frankly, we know they wanted to draft Devontae Smith at number 11. Philly jumped him. Dallas clearly had no other use for a wide receiver that early. So Philly jumped him in the trade with Dallas. But I, I'll be honest, you know, while I would, just because of pedigree, I would rank Devontae Smith higher than Tony if he were with the Giants. I'd be asking some of the same questions here, Ross, like where are the targets going to come from? It's just that Tony is a much more um, raw prospect than Devontae Smith at this stage of their careers. The next guy in the first round, it's interesting because NFL.com, and they have guys like Nico Collins, Terrace Marshall, Elijah Moore, ahead of Rashad Bateman, who went to the Ravens near the end of round one, pick 27. Yeah, I I like the pick for the Ravens. I hate it for the Fantasy Feast. Because say whatever you want about Lamar Jackson. I mean, he's one of the most discussed players in the NFL. You could be the biggest Lamar Jackson fan on planet Earth. And even you are not going to say, you know what they need to do? Drop Lamar back 40 times a game. It's not going to happen. So the Ravens come out here and look, Hollywood Brown is a specific kind of player. I think he was probably a little bit miscast if they were looking for that number one receiver. He also had big time problems with drops last year. He's going to be in a better position to produce, I think, now when the pressure isn't on him. But look at the receiving core with Baltimore. Yeah. We said it last year, the number one receiver in Baltimore was Mark Andrews, the tight end. He's still there. They bring in Sammy Watkins, who is the worst good player in the NFL, um, or maybe the best bad player in the NFL. I'm not really sure which one, but he's one of the two. Um, They drafted Rashad Bateman, who profiles to me as an ex. Um, I think one of the problems that a lot of people might have had, and maybe NFL.com had this problem as well, is he weighed in, I think, a lot less than people anticipated. I think he came in at under 190 at his pro day, which I think surprised people. This is a guy who on tape looks like he's playing above 200 pounds. Just kind of a a good go-up-and-get-it possession receiver in the vein of an Allen Robinson. I really like the prospect. The Again, the question is, where are the targets coming from? Baltimore just doesn't throw the ball that much. And y- y- you can love, 
You can love Lamar Jackson and know that he's not going to attempt 600 passes this year. It's just not the way that it's it's going to work out. I've got Rashad Bateman right now at wide receiver 80. Um, Again, probably a little bit low. Um, I think there's a chance he comes in here and leads this wide receiver group in targets. But this is a team that continues to invest in the position and none of the guys produce. So you bring in Sammy Watkins. You have Hollywood Brown. They drafted Tylen Wallace, who fell to the fourth round. And we'll certainly talk about him on a on a future podcast. But I love the pick for the team. I love the pick for Lamar Jackson and his development. I hate it for fantasy. So those are all the first round picks. We did Chase. Waddle, Smith, Tony, and Bateman. There's a bunch of second and third round picks we will get to next week, which we don't need to spend as much time on. They're not going to be ranked as high by you. Guys like Elijah Moore, Rondale Moore. I guess my question, Joe, since we'll have more guys to talk about next week, to kind of bridge the gap between the two shows, rookie wide receivers. What have they done in recent years? It feels like, certainly if you talk to people where we're from, rookie receivers have been awesome other than the ones the Eagles <laughs> Philadelphia. have drafted. DK uh, Metcalf and uh, obviously Justin Jefferson. It feels like they've been good. Terry McLaurin. Mm-hmm. Where have these guys ended up at the end of the year? Have they been, like, good, good for fantasy or just good for rookies fantasy? Uh, uh, Well, Justin Jefferson was good, good for fantasy. I mean, he had the best rookie season ever uh, by a wide receiver. Although, I mean, I'd still take – I'd still take Randy Moss's rookie season. Um, but Minnesota has a good history of that. Um, Now, there's guys who have been good – um, and there's guys like DK Metcalf was a guy who was kind of a tale of two seasons. I think he came on in the second half of his rookie season. Terry McLaurin uh, is a guy who produced pretty much from the outset and didn't have like a massive rookie season, but clearly showed the potential. But the history of guys like AJ Green, Julio Jones, you know, these guys going high in the first round. With the exception of that weird 2017 draft where you had John Ross and and Corey Davis and Mike Williams all go in the top 10 and none of them produced as rookies. Um, John Ross to this point still hasn't produced at all. Uh, He's with the Giants too, by the way, so there's another body there. Um, (laughs) So um, these guys, I think you anticipate if they go in the top 10, top half of the first round, these guys are going to produce at some point. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a case-by-case basis though, Ross. Like you, you, you compare and contrast them as targets. You know, you look at the fact that last year, Jay, Jalen Rager went ahead of a bunch of receivers who ended up out producing him. You know, he goes in the first round. Justin Jefferson goes one pick later. Brandon Ayuk goes a few picks later. They outproduced him. Then you go to the second round and T. Higgins and Chase Claypool and Michael Pittman outproduced him. So it, you know, it's it, I think situation's a big part of it. I think coaching's a big part of it. Depth chart's a big part of it. And there's there's a reason why I like guys like Devontae Smith. And, um, and and Jamar Chase way more than Jalen Waddle. There's a reason I like all of those guys way more than Tony and Bateman, the guys who went at the end of the first round, because A, draft capital does matter, and B, the situations are better for those guys. So it's a case-by-case basis for me. But if you just go in and say, well, I'm not drafting a rookie wide receiver, that, that is a way too narrow point of view uh, to take. And if you go in and say, I'm drafting all the rookie wide receivers, you're probably not going to be very successful doing that either. Always and never are never the right answer. I guess that doesn't make sense. That's a, well, always yeah, that's... and never are never the right answer unless we're saying that you should always go to fantasypoints.com and use the code 21 feast. Joe is just one of a veritable army of fantasy analysts just dropping bombs. Greg Cosell, who will be on tomorrow's Fantasy Feast podcast as well. Get engaged, get involved. Hit us up on social media at FG underscore Dolan. I'm at Ross Tucker NFL. We are at Ross Tucker Pod. And if you rate and review the show, we will go ahead and answer any question you ask us in a future episode. Just screenshot it. Send it to me, Ross at Ross Other than that, I'm stuffed. We're done. Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Feast podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Ross Tucker football podcast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and the College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.
A lot of times on the show, I mentioned DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler or in Indiana, 109 with it. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, it doesn't always. Sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in site credit. 